Welcome to the Unsecurity Podcast. Each week, Evan and Brad give an inside look at current information security news, breaches, best practices, and other things you should know to improve your information security. Here are your hosts, FR Secure's Evan Francine and Brad Nye. All right, welcome back. This is episode 64 of the Unsecurity Podcast. I'm your host this week, Brad Nye. Today is January 27th, and joining me is my co-host, Evan Francine. Good morning, Evan. Good morning. <clears throat> you said I'm supposed to say something energetic and uplifting? I wrote this last night. I was oh. getting a little... It's uh, like, oh, shoot, I forgot to write I know. notes. It's hard to have energy on Monday. Yeah. So, um, yay. Hey, hey, at least it's going to be warm this week. Right. See? Did, did you see what I wrote in the show notes about oh, no. our party? Because... Things went so fast last week. We had our party. We had our year end, uh, year end first quarter. All hands. All hands. So we had like eighty some, you know, eighty There's people. So many here. people. It was awesome. Yeah. So that was uh, that's uplifting. That was yeah. awesome. Yeah, it was good seeing everyone. There was a lot of really, yeah. You know, it's always fun. A lot yeah. of uh, you catching up with people. You don't. <laughs> right. It's hard to get stuff done sometimes, but that's a good thing. It is a good thing. So, well, before we really get going, I want to, I know you and I had talked uh, one day, one day at the end of last week, about all the stuff that was going on and yeah. you know, you've made a lot of really cool things that are coming down the pipe. Anything you wanted to kind of update or talk about? Yeah. yeah. Well, last week was a blur. Oh. <laughs> I mean, we created the level zero assessment, um, which is uh, going on in the platform, the security studio platform soon. That's pretty cool. Uh, one of the things we, you know, one of the areas of focus for us is schools, mm -hmm. K through 12. And when you look at the full S2 org assessment, you know, it's overwhelming. I think for a lot of people that maybe don't have, you know, information security programs already established. So we had to create, you know, like a level zero. We'll walk them through a level zero uh, onto a level one assessment, onto a level two, and then eventually the level three, which is the existing S2 org assessment. So, you know, the S2 org has been wildly successful. I think we've done over a thousand ish of them over the years. Uh, so now it's just bringing it down to a level, trying to meet people where they're at. So that was a big thing. Um, the air force, we're doing some, you know, potential work with the air force. That's very could cool. Be, yeah. That could be really neat. Where we're taking the S2 me, assessment, the personal information security risk assessment, and uh, potentially using that for troops, right? So yeah. the theory is the same person, you know, behind the iPad at home is the same person behind, you know, the, the workstation or the laptop. Right. You know, yeah. in the field. It's sensitive information. Yeah. And then uh, just wrote a bunch of stuff. So yeah, it was a crazy week. Lots of meetings. Oh, I had a meeting on Saturday. I even worked on Saturday. Oh, I forgot about that. Because you just asked me before we started the podcast <laughs> <laughs> what I did this weekend. Uh, Saturday, I had a meeting with uh, a recently promoted CISO with a big healthcare organization. Cool. Yeah, and we were just talking shop. Uh, you know, they say, you know, I think he used the word mentor, but it's it goes both ways, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I get to learn what he's kind of struggling with. Um, so that was really cool too. How about you? What was your week? Yeah, uh, a blur. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, you know, it, it's funny how you have like your week planned out and then something comes up last minute and just blows everything out of the water. And so that yeah. happened and just spent a lot of time working on that, which is good, but just puts you behind the, mm -hmm. the ball on everything else. So a lot of catch up this week. Jeff's in my hour. Uh, I had a couple – no, a couple of triages came in, um, more around those networks or networks, uh, Netscaler, mm -hmm. uh, vulnerabilities and a couple of active ones on that, but no, it wasn't too bad. Yeah. So that's good. My beard keeps hitting the, I know you have to, screen on I have to keep, I have to microphone. adjust it so I, it doesn't hit it. It's, it's a beard problem. Yeah. It sucks yeah. to be us. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, you know, good weeks though. Um, yeah. One of the things that did come up and, and this is why we were talking about this is, is vendor risk management. Uh, you know, and we had 
uh, obviously I can't mention any names, but we have a, a client that had done the ST org and submitted that as evidence of the risk assessment uh, as a vendor. And there was the organization accepting or that was requesting it had some questions about it. So then, and I was like, you know, it, they're, it just feels like they're missing the point. Right. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit here today. So, you know, what's the difference between an audit based certification? So, you know, the big ones I think that really jump out at people are, you know, if it's a SOC 2 or an ISO or a high trust certification versus having a risk assessment such as the S2 org and kind of what are the big differences between the two? Um, so one of the big things that really jumped out at me that I think that they were missing the picture on is when you do those audit certifications, you define the scope and it's certifying that scope and that's it, you know, versus, Hey, let's do a holistic assessment of the security program of the organization as a whole. Yeah. Do we say we need to see evidence of the logs of your endpoint protection on these dates over these times over the past year? No, but we do look and make sure that, Hey, do you have this in place? What, what's going on? And, I think that was a really big sticking point that like the client just could not grasp or just didn't seem to get, you know, Hey, just because they've got high trust or they've got a SOC two doesn't mean that they've got a good, like a fully secure program. No, no. And, and I heard a little bit about this conversation on Friday uh, from somebody else who was involved in the conversation and it reminds me of part of what we talked about on Saturday with the uh, this you know newly appointed CISO. It's what are you trying to accomplish? Right. I mean, what are the goals? What's the objective of third party or vendorous management? Now, mm-hmm. I like I like to get literal because if we're using these terms, what do they actually even mean? Right. So a lot right. of times people will say vendor risk management, and then so I've talked to non security people about you know, hey, vendor risk management, and they're like, they're thinking something totally different. You mm-hmm. know, non-security people, they're thinking things like, um, you know, financial risk, you know, have mm-hmm. they had financial audits? They're thinking about reputational things, uh, you know, all in the procurement process. Yeah. So I like to, and that's why, you know, literally it's, it's not necessarily just vendors. It's all of, you know, if you want to do this right, it's all of your third parties. Yeah. All your yeah. third-party relationships should be assessed for risk, right, and information security risk specifically. So what's the objective? If my objective is just to check the box, fine. Show me your SOC 2, and I won't even read it. Right. I'll just check the box that you had one. Right. Uh, or ISO certification or complete my um, you know, my custom questionnaire, complete my SIG questionnaire, yeah. and God – how many right. different things do we run vendors and third parties through the, uh, so if it's just, you know, I just need to check the box, then yeah, let's just get a SOC too, where you can define scope, but I'm not even going to check. I don't care what your scope is. You Oof. define your illustr- illustrative controls. You right. can game the system as much as you want, whatever. I don't care. If that's the objective, great. Right. Do your SOC twos. Uh, and it, there are good SOC twos as well, right? But you actually have to read it. Right. If it, well, does it I mean, account for the risk that I'm looking for? And same with high trust. You just get a report saying, yep, they're high trust certified. Right. But you can get certified and and have nothing in certain areas. For sure. Absolutely. And, and I've seen again, SOC 2s where, right. <laughs> where you've done a, a risk assessment like an S2 org of an organization that has a SOC 2 and you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, because they whoa, they did it on one department or one process – or they define their illustrative they controls can, so loosely. Right. You know, so, you know, I know about this conversation that took place with this company that you're, that you are not mentioning. And this is somebody, it, it was obvious from the, from what I heard that this was a junior level type of information security analyst who was told that this is what they have to have. And so when they didn't get what they have to have, which would, in this case would be a SOC 2 or something similar, I'm going to push right. back and say, well, where's my... Sock too. Right. It's great that and, you got this thing and this thing might be better. Right. But where's it, my sock too? Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and where's my high trust or where's my ISO? You know, and that was you know that was part of it is, hey, sure, I've got a high trust certification. Do you push for specific details of every area of their high trust? No, right. Nobody does that. Well, how is right? And, well, we'll get to that. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but you know, but that's the frustrating part is people jump so far to just a specific thing, right? Why are you asking for your thing? Mm -hmm. You know, if you can't define the objective, if it, this doesn't fit with specifically what you're trying to accomplish, then you're wasting everybody's time. Well, and, and if you can't answer that question, go back to the basics. Right. Well, and we've seen uh, healthcare uh, uh, breaches where they've come in and said, no, you were doing a risk assessment on right certain areas. But because you didn't have segmentation in place, because you weren't doing anything in the non healthcare specific, right? So finance, HR, those types of areas, there was a breach in one of those that led to data loss. Right. Well, it's the same thing. It, we're, yeah. we're, you got to have the security across the organization, not just blindly trust. And, you know, I've never seen an organization get their entire company high trust certified or SOC 2 certified. Right. It's always narrow the scope. Yeah. Which I get it. Right? right. I mean, Oh yeah. If, if the, if the objective is just to check the box, it's just to get my certificate, just to get my thing, then do it as cheaply as possible. Right. The objective right. is not to be secure. The objective is to get my thing. Right. And so it goes back to, again, you know, what are the objectives? What do you really want to accomplish with this? If you really want to know what the information security risk is in this vendor or third party relationship, well, that's something totally different. Mm -hmm. And that's frustrating. It's frustrating for everybody. It's frustrating for vendors. Yeah. And well, and vendors never know, right? No, it goes back to the fundamental issue of nobody speaking the same language right. of what is expected. Yeah. And no two requests are exactly the same. And it's, it no. gets, it does get frustrating. Well, and, and, you know, you're, you're stuck kind of between a rock and a hard place when you have, when you are the third party, because you're limited in how much you can push back. Mm -hmm. You know, when I've been, uh, it reminds me of a conversation I had with a big global company and it was somebody that they had just hired, right? Somebody with like 30 years of information security experience. He was, he had the experience and he came in and said, we need to get a SOC too. I'm like, I'm sorry. Why? Well, because we have to, um, who said, right. right. Well, I'm not doing it unless it's going to make us more money or it's going to serve our mission better. Right. I'm a security person, but I understand that we're in business to make money. He's like, well, you have to have one. And I was like, well, I don't No, I don't need to have one. And then he says, we well, need it for PCI compliance. I'm like, what in the hell are we talking about? Wait, <laughs> You're mixing, you're mixing things now. Right. And then somehow ISO certification got into that conversation as well. But it was buzzwords. It was things that this person, over 30 years, believe it or not, that where he came from, he was so stuck in the, in his ways and so stuck in this big company that he was in where you had a SOC too. You had an ISO certification yeah. because they can afford to do things wrong. Uh, so then he comes to this other company where, well, I, you have to have one. No, you don't. Just because you had one somewhere you came from right. before doesn't mean you have to have one. No, it should be a valid business justification, right? right? It's just a crazy conversation. Oh, yeah. Well, you see that all the time too. And I think it goes back again to what are – as a as the client setting expectations correctly and understanding what are you trying to get out of this program. Like right. you said, if you're just trying to check the box – Check the box, just accept it and move on. Right. But, you know, I think, I guess that's a good question is as the, as the client, what should be the end goal? What, what are you trying to accomplish? You know, what would be a best practice if, if when you're reaching out to your vendors? Well, for me, I mean, most organizations need to back all the way up. And this is the same thing I was talking to the new CISO on Saturday is, you need to define what you want to accomplish as the CISO, as somebody who is responsible for really only two jobs. You know, we overcomplicate everything. Mm -hmm. I think I think a CISO has two jobs. One, I consult you on information security risk. Right. 
you being the business. business right that's job one number one job number two is once you make those risk decisions i implement those risk decisions to the best of my ability that's my job two things right but in order to do that you kind of have to define so bring this to vendor risk management if i haven't defined those things for my overall information security program you're shooting in the dark with your vendor risk management program right right yeah <laughs> one feeds one comes first so a lot of times it's take you all the way back to that. Now, for organizations that just don't have any idea what they want to do with vendor risk management, I think the best thing is just defensibility. Mm -hmm. You know that something bad is going to happen. Chances are good based on studies that you read that the bad thing that happens will probably come through a vendor. Right. So being prepared for that, when the bad thing happens through a vendor, who becomes your enemy? Your customers? opposing counsel, mm -hmm. regulators. So did I do enough to not be negligent? Do I have something to stand on or am I just bend over and take it? Right. right. So my vendor risk management program would start probably there. If I haven't defined all these other risk things and gotten really. Yeah. Deep. Understanding exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. You, you need to know what, what is the classification of the vendor? What do they have access to? Right. right. That's, that's the first step. Well, Beyond, you know, well, I guess going back one, knowing who your vendors are is the first step. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> and, we overcomplicate that process yeah. too, right? Four steps in vendor risk management or third-party risk management. Yeah. Inventory, right. classification. Assess. And, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. What do they have access to? Is it is it somebody that's a low risk, right? Is it the guy that comes and stocks the vending machines? Right. Yeah. That there is, there, you need to be aware of it. And that goes part to part of defensibility, right? You can't just pick and choose which vendors you're going to classify. Well, how did you def ha defend that decision? Right. Right. So, uh, and I know we've had that conversation with other very large, you know, national companies in, in the mm -hmm. past around, well, we think these are the, we think these are the hundred or so. Like, well, how many do you have? Oh, I don't know. Right. Like, well, hey, time out. How do you, how are you picking these hundred if you don't even know who you have? Right. So anyway, yeah, find all your vendors, classify them, understand it. And then yeah, the, the, the next step is depending on that classification. Sure. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever to send a 600 page questionnaire to a low risk vendor. Yeah. You mean your full stig shouldn't go to the. Uh, probably not. <laughs> to everyone. No. Uh, well, and a lot of this experience comes from, I mean, this isn't, you know, third-party information security risk management isn't anything new. No. You know, large companies, companies that have received, you know, quite a bit of regulatory pressure, you know, like big banks, they've been doing third-party information security risk management for a long time. Right. They don't do it well, but they've been doing it. The driver has been compliance, you know, right. for them, you know, whether it be the OCC or FDIC. And then, you know, I think the most famous breach, you know, of all time through a third party would have been the target breach, right? And so then everybody sort of rushed and they saw a bunch of companies sort of start these vendor risk management things. Right. High trust became a big thing or bigger thing. Um, SOC 2, I mean, you saw probably a big bump in business mm -hmm. there because people are still scrambling with like, what the hell am I supposed to do? And if you just simplify it, right, we've already talked. Phase one is just inventory, right? And there's two parts to inventory. There's the initial inventory of like what, who are my third-party relationships? And then mm -hmm. there's the ongoing inventory. Right. The ongoing inventory, depending on what kind of churn you have in your third parties. If, if you have low churn, just reconcile your third-party inventory on an annual basis. Right. It's yeah. plenty fine. It doesn't well, have to stay live. Right. And, and it's, if you do it correctly the first time where you've identified the relationship owner internally, that's an easy thing to do. Exactly. Hey, are Absolutely. we still doing business? Are these, is this still a yes or no? Right. And has anything changed? Yep. Then step two, we call, you know, being security people, we like to use our fancy words. It's inherent risk, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's how you classify your vendors. Right. We don't account for any controls. There are five to 10 questions that anybody should be able to answer that uh, your vendor relationship managers should be able to answer. They're basic things like how are we using this vendor? Do right. they come into our office? Do we connect to them? I mean, just stuff. Right. 
And then, you know, based on that classification, I, I like to keep it simple, high, medium, or low, high risk vendors, you're going to get a lot of scrutiny. Yep. You know, but out of my, you know, that might be 5% of all my vendors might be those high risk vendors. And then, uh, you know, once you've gotten through the assessment itself, which can be a questionnaire, there's nothing wrong with questionnaires. Right. What's wrong is questionnaires that are subjective, open-ended. <laughs> you mean you don't want to go through? No. And reading through open-ended questions, trying to interpret right. how they wrote things that make themselves look better. Right. Answer, ask yes, no questions that anybody should be able to answer. Right. If you know your environment, you can answer, you know, something as simple as, do you have an asset inventory? Right. Right. And then. Please describe your asset inventory process. Right. And then oh. after that question, then I will ask you. So it gets a little bit longer. The questionnaire gets a little bit longer because I have to ask more binary questions. Right. After that first one. But it also makes it easier to score, set thresholds, do comparisons. Mm -hmm. you know, when I do objective assessments. Uh, and then you make the, you know, the decision. That's step four. Right. You suck at security. I'm sorry. You're going to have to remediate or we can't do business. Right. Right. And yeah, it, and I think you're right. Everybody, people just, I think it's overcomplicated because they maybe just don't understand or uh, they just don't know what the right tool is. Maybe I'm not sure. Well, there's so many different poles in so many different directions, right? Yeah. I mean, you, uh, you, you have lots of people doing SOC two and they're dead set that that's the right thing. Right. If you ask any accounting firm, they're not going to, steer you away right. from they make money doing SOC right. 2 so they're all going to say SOC 2 yeah that's the yeah. way you go and not just that but you do a type 2 you know right. make a little right. more money right and that's not to say that the controls and like the points of focus and everything are bad right that's not that's not <laughs> the issue with it so as an organization undergoing it you define what they're looking at if you're right. if you do it correctly there's no reason you should ever fail a SOC 2 well and that's the I mean SOC 2 is just a tool, mm -hmm. right? Just like any other tool. And if you use the tool correctly, right. it's a great tool. If you use it for something it's not intended for. Yeah, you can – it's – I mean, realistically, yeah, yeah, it could be manipulated to right. do what you want. But correct, if it's if it's done correctly, yeah, it right. is an assurance that people are doing right. what they say they're doing. And so if you're using SOC 2s for the checkbox, that's not the right use for the tool. Mm -hmm. You actually need to read the SOC 2 report and right. ensure that whatever it is you're doing with this vendor or third party is in scope within the SOC 2 report, right. that the illustrative controls are interpreted correctly to address the risks that you're concerned about. You know, it, it ends up being, believe it or not, if you use a SOC 2 the way it's intended to be used, it ends up being more work. It's a lot to read through those. It is. You know, because then and then you're also relying on the subjectivity or the interpretation of the person reading the report, mm -hmm. right? To determine whether or not it's adequate, right? So it's no matter how black and white they try to make it, because an audit, you know, you know, it's a pass fail, right? So you mm -hmm. get the unqualified opinion from the CPA, but that's his opinion. You have to interpret; you still have to interpret his or her opinion, right? And and they're interpreting it and looking at evidence on. They're CPAs, not right. technology or security people. Right. So, yeah, you have a CPA interpreting right. security that's not always and, – and I the good ones will fully admit that, hey, this isn't our strong area. No, right. Right. So. Yeah. So, I mean, SOC 2 is – I don't think they're inherently bad. It's just you're not using them right. Yeah. Yeah, people just say, oh, good, they got their SOC 2, I'll accept it. I mean, if I were to receive a SOC 2, so, you know, this is maybe something that I would do if I had a vendor risk management program that, uh, you know, I would use the S2 org because it's a tool that I understand. It's mm -hmm. true or false. It's objective. I can set thresholds. It's completely defensible. Excuse me. All those things are great. Uh, but if I had a third party that said, you know, we're just not, we're putting our foot down. We're done doing any other questionnaires, done doing any other assessments, but we have a SOC 2. Will you take it? Yeah. Right. I would take it. I would review it. I would say, you know, it would take me a little bit of time to read it. And I might even take that, what I read in the SOC 2 and interpret that into their questionnaire so I can stay within my own process. But right. it's not invalid. No, no. And I think... You know, it's interesting. We, we're starting to see a lot more 
um, clients that are asking us to help help what? Uh, fill out questionnaires. Really? So yeah. they're like, talk about a I'm, I'm getting pissing away time, right? R- well, right. But the nice thing is with, you know, these are ones that have done the S2 org and we're on. And oh, so it makes it a lot easier, but it, yeah, they're, they're, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of one I talked to a couple of weeks ago and he was getting four to six questionnaires a month. Mm-hmm. And can you imagine filling out a stig four times a month? Right. I, oh. Right. Cause it's not like you can, yeah. Or custom questionnaires or whatever. Right. But yeah, if you have a standard, that's two org in this case. Yeah. It makes it really easy to just kind of rip through it a lot faster. So. Well, that's it. I mean, I think there's so many in there in our industry, we argue with ourselves so much, right? Right. Like which one's better? Well, I'm a SOC 2 guy. Well, I'm a high trust guy. Well, I'm an S2 org guy and I'm a this guy or that guy or whatever. It's like, seriously, just pick one and then use interpretations. Right? right. So allow people to do what they feel comfortable doing. And it's our job as an industry to figure out how we can consume it and use it. It's uh, it's just really frustrating because at the end of the day, who really suffers is the small business that gets these questionnaires and can't afford to fill them out. Right. Right. Well, and it's hours of <laughs> wasted work. Yeah. How long does it take to fill out a STIG or a STIG light? A couple hours each. Oh, the, the SIG it, itself? The light. Yeah. Well, the oh, light's yeah. a couple because that's what 90-something questions and it's not yes and yeah, well, it's yeah. mess. And that's why we created – so the S2 org is itself is 687 questions, mm-hmm. but they're true-false questions. Right. To the – or yes, no, or whatever. Yeah. It's easy to answer those. It's funny. I was talking to some guy who never even looked at it. Okay. From the S2 vendor tool received an S2 org assessment. And said, we're not going to fill it out. Right. And so he's telling the customer this, you know, like, will you talk to him? So I'm like, sure, I'll talk to him. I'm like, why, why won't you fill it out? He says, well, it'll take too much. It's too much wasted time. I'm like, how much time do you think it will take? Well, six hours. I'm like, I'm sorry. 687 questions <laughs> divided by six hours. You do the math and you find out it's like, <laughs> yeah, a, whatever it was. It was like a minute and a half per question. I'm like, it takes you a minute and a half to answer a true false question. He's like, well, yeah, you have to read the question. I'm like, it takes you a minute and a half to read a true and, false question well, and answer and, it. And they're not like paragraphs. Right. It's like a sentence. Yeah. Do you have a security – do you have information security policies? Yes or no? Right. Are and they so reviewing it? Was, it was funny because then I got to the point where it's like, okay, let's just play this out. I'll give you an example just question, not even security related. And, and then we're going to wait. You know, a minute and a half. We're going to wait 90 seconds for you to answer that question. Yeah. Are you wearing underwear today? Don't answer. <laughs> Hold up. You know, and I'm looking at my clock and you're looking at my watch. And he's like, well, that's not how it works. I'm like, that's no, exactly how it, it works. Is. And if you don't know your information security program well enough to be able to answer true false questions about your information security program, then you have work to do. Right. You like, kind of suck at your job. Well, and, and, there are areas you're going to want to pull in the, the, you know, the, the owners of that within the organization, sure. you know, HR and, um, the CFO for insurance and financial stuff. But even then it's, it's, right. they, they're going to typically know that stuff. Well, and the things that we need to focus on where we find most of the risk is fundamentals. Right. It's the basics. Yeah. Right. You're not asking a detailed question about, you know, this specific configuration or this specific log. Right. So even those true false questions on the basics, the fundamentals, most people should be able to answer. Right. Right. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you do background checks on your employees? That's an HR focused question. Right. Everybody in the organization should probably knows that because right. you've had to sign the sheet that says, I let you do this. Right. And there might be some vendors like extremely high risk vendors, meaning inherent risk, not Mm -hmm. residual risk, that they're so impactful to your organization that you will want more. Sure. Right. I'm not going to take your word for it. On the 687 questions, I'm not going to take your word for it. I don't believe you or I need to validate it. Whatever reason, then send somebody to validate the assessment 
But what you're validating are true false questions that apply to information security risk. What you're not validating is interpretations of questions, Mm -hmm. right? So if a question says all, because I've run into this many times too, if a question says blah, 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 all, blah, 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 and you say, well, we do it. Yeah, we do that. It's like, for all? Right. Well, most. That's not what it says. It's not the same. (laughs) It's not what the question says. The question says all. You know, that's different than most. Um, so that, that's one of the things I think over the years with information security, I've become so literal. Well, it's I like, mean, you have to specifically, what are you asking for? Right. Uh, yeah, you do have to, because there's so many different interpretations of a word like information security. What is information security? And people are like, well, it's, you know, access control. Like actually when you build an information security program, you find that access control, if I were building it, like I was building a house, access control is like third floor. Yeah. That's you, well, you, because it is fully dependent on right. Yeah. Asset and uh, identity. Right. And then I like you to get, start. I like to start. So tomorrow I'll be in New York talking to a board of directors and it's interesting how, you know, you just, just a basic conversation about what are we trying to do? Mm hmm. We're spending millions and millions of dollars on information security in this organization. What are we trying to accomplish? Well, be, be safe. We want to be secure. Right. And let's <laughs> what, be specific, what does that mean? Yeah, let's be as specific as possible. And let's compare the mission. You know, So most organizations have a mission statement. How many information security programs or CISOs have a mission statement? Um, and does that mission statement align with the organization's mission statement? Does it enable it? Right. And it then, should be supporting it. Yeah. Right. So sometimes you have to get sort of rudimentary and you know, mechanical, you know, as you go through this stuff. But my God, if you want to do it right, do it right. Yeah. We get paid pretty well. I, I mean, most, most security people get paid pretty well. Yeah. No, so I should figure it out. <laughs> yeah. I think so. One of the, you know, we've covered most of those bullet points, but at the end of the day, well, I guess that's kind of combining two there, but, uh, what what should a vendor share or not share? What level, you know, would be acceptable? And at what point do they kind of say, eh, "That's I can't yeah. share that." What, you know, how how do you think they should handle that? Well, that's 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 a good question. Um, it depends on the relationship, you know. Really, I think with the uh, with your customer, yeah, I you have a tight relationship where you feel like you can be transparent. Share if it's an existing relationship. You know, yeah, right. but it's, it, there is, that's a risk that you as an organization have to make. Hey, I'm going to give the blueprint for all our strengths and weaknesses right. to somebody else. Well, and what we advise, you know, our clients is give them the S2 score. Mm-hmm. Right. And so if they, and then if they ask, well, what's the S2 score, you know, then we can go into more detail about what that encompasses, what the score right. represents, how the math is calculated, what the score actually means. Without going into the details of your individual answers, right? right. Your individual weaknesses. Almost so the, the, I would say that that executive report is about it because that's going to give them a good understanding across sure. administrative, physical, and technical. Mm-hmm. And then within the main areas of each, where are we at? Right. And creating a pub, maybe even a publicly consumable mm-hmm. report, you know, out of the results of the S2 org or the S2 score. I mean, it's the same thing when you think about personal credit, right? If I, if I'm doing business with you, I can ask your credit score Mm -hmm. and you'll probably give it to me, right? Right. Because I'm going to loan you money. Right. Now, in some cases, I may want to pull that credit report. So you have to give me authorization to pull that credit report. So I get to see, you know, more, but I still don't see the details of a lot of the things that you do on a day-to-day basis. I can just see results of those things. Right. So- you know, I'd keep it, you know, and then, but then you have some vendor relationships where maybe, well, I guess this is, this would be my ultimate advice. Define what you share with your customers, put it in policy somewhere. Mm -hmm. So whatever that's going to be, if it's just going to be the S2 score or it's just going to be the SOC 2 cover page or whatever it is that, that you're willing to share and nothing else, and then if you have vendor relationships where you're tighter, you're closer, you're you're more friendly, mm-hmm. just write a waiver, you know, yeah. and, and maybe share more so you can be more transparent with them. Yeah. 
Especially if you're doing well. (laughs) Well, we should tout it, right? I mean, that's the thing. Security has been treated as a cost center forever. Uh, Can we use information security as a business driver? Can we make more money because we do security well? Hell yeah, you can. Yeah, I mean, if you're spending a couple million bucks on information security, you better get a damn return out of it. Yeah. Well, and that's always something that's so hard to to prove too, right? Right. How do we do it? So – you wrote, I don't know, have you published this yet? No. Okay. I'm so, going to create a pretty, I've never done an infographic. Have you ever created an infographic before? No. Yeah, me neither. I'm not creative enough. So funny enough, I so I wrote the notes for the podcast, you know, yesterday evening. Yeah. And come in this morning, you're like, hey, look what I wrote last week. Right. And it's seven must-haves for third-party information security risk management, which is, you know, just kind of funny. We're We're... Oh, yeah. On the same page here. And these um, are absolute must-haves. If I was going to build an information, a third-party information security risk management program, I wouldn't do it without these things. Yeah. No, I, and, and admittedly, I haven't, you know, I've, I've had this for Egg about it. 10 minutes before I, the I podcast. Out, yeah, I printed it out right before the podcast. And here. All right. So we'll, let's go through these. Is that okay with you? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Must have number one, adequate coverage. So must account for administrative, physical, and technical risk. Period. Uh, makes sense. It has to. Right? right. Well, we've defined information security as yeah. those three things. Exactly. So, And you know that the most significant risk is always people. So if you're only focused on technical controls, right, you're missing the biggest risk. Right. right. In physical, you can't just discount it. It may not no. be huge because you've got stuff out in the in the cloud, you've got an Azure or whatever else. You still have an office. Right. In that office, there's some sort of you know communication between that and the cloud. So you have to take into account physical risk. Well, we get that question a lot too is well, we have a lot of remote workers, so how do you well <laughs> well that's a whole nother physical risk that oh for sure. Do you have remote worker policies, things like that? Yeah, I mean, do you define, do they have to keep, like when I worked at Wells Fargo, uh, the way they accounted for physical risk, in, you know, for teleworkers was you had to have a dedicated locked office in your house if you were going to work in your house. Okay. Right? It would seem legitimate and they had a clean desk policy, you know, yeah. for the house and all those things because they don't want kids coming in and taking right. things and God knows what happens. Loan application has like a smiley face on it and crayon. Right. But, uh, and this is the one, so this must have the adequate coverage is the one place where people are most likely to take their shortcut yeah. right out of the gate. They, they assume that some scan, some vulnerability scan, whether it be our, uh, you know, bit site or security scorecard right. or whatever, check the box. I'm done. Mm, no, I almost said bad, bad word right there. That's not true. Uh, you have to do administrative and physical. Those are great tools, right? It's just like any it's a other part tool. of right, right. Just like any other tool, understand the tool and and master its use. They're good for what they do, but They're it's not the whole picture. What they do. Exactly. Right. Anytime I see somebody using BitSight, I'm not. I don't cringe. The only time I cringe is when you're using BitSight and that's, that's it. it. Yeah, I'm with you. Um. So no shortcuts. Uh, must have number two. Automated workflows. Yes. Yeah. Manual processes with spreadsheets and calendars are error prone, costly, and ineffective. Yeah. Yeah. And I guarantee any security person that's been doing this for any amount of time is nodding their head going, oh, yeah, tell me about it. Um, It's amazing how many times I still see it, though. Oh, we get – I answer our questionnaires that we get. And they'll make their – and they'll make their – I've seen – I've seen – questionnaires in in workbooks excel but they've gotten so fancy with them too i mean they've got macros i mean it's just like a beautiful well, yeah it's but, like it's still a piece of crap because it's still well, manual and and best practices we're going to disable macros and yeah, tv right. from third party or unknown sources right. I'm, I'm not running your macros sorry and there's a there are many Automated workflow tools and it, you know, automated workflow enabled tools on the market mm-hmm. for third party information security risk management. Obviously, we have S2 vendor that yep. we use on Security Studio. Uh, but I'd be remiss to tell you that there wasn't, there's not but, many others. So, yeah. Well, and, and again, I, we're obviously a little bit biased and thinking that it's good and all that, but 
it's not always going to be the right fit for everyone. Right. Find the find the right tool for you and your organization. Exactly. But find a tool. Yep. So right. must have number one, uh, no shortcuts. Must have number two, automated right. workflow. All right. Number three, distributed workloads. So yes. no one person can do it all is really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. So not, I think – Not well anyway. Well, yeah. Yeah. The, I think I liked what you had here is, you know, if you have like a vendor risk manager, that, that shouldn't be the person who does everything. They right. should be – managing the program, working with the relationship owners within the organization, your vendor risk manager shouldn't be classifying all your vendors. Right. That's there. There's no way they could possibly know that they can make sure that all your vendors are, are classified. Right. All your vendors are answering questionnaires, right. making recommendations, but they shouldn't be doing the whole thing. No, no, not unless it's a real small company with only one or two vendors where the, where the actual risk manager knows these yeah. things because the key is for you know that classification is knowing how you use the vendor mm -hmm. the only way you'll know how you use the vendor is if you work with the vendor exactly yeah yeah i think that's a good point though small those really small organizations where every, you know excuse me you may know everything yeah, yeah that makes sense but as you get larger and more vendors you, you can't possibly well even in this that. organization right i mean we're, oh, yeah. we're Getting close to a hundred employees. I don't know how many vendor relationships we have, but yeah, I don't, I don't think one person can do it. You've got Jeff who does IT, who has a bunch of vendor mm -hmm. relationships. You have HR relationships. We have yeah. Tech. It, who who's the office manager now? Uh, Danielle. So she's got office yeah, officey uh, stuff stuff. I mean, I know that right. they, there's always coffee. There's always things here, right? Yeah. So even in this organization of a hundred ish employees we have we have way more vendors than right and than you have would, to have be surprised and that's one of the pushbacks i've heard before is well we don't we don't have any vendor relationships mm. like there is no organization in the world that doesn't have vendor relationships right. unless you made your own office furniture you made your own computers made your own operating system right yeah who does your maintenance who does right any yeah any of that stuff that those are those are all vendors we have a plumbing issue who do you call yeah. With the plumber. Oh, there you go. That's another one. Yeah. People don't think about that. All right. So number three, don't try to tackle third-party information security risk alone. Exactly. Number four, quantification. Mm -hmm. uh, easier to defend a process or system than to defend a judgment. I think you've talked about this in, in terms of from a legal perspective. It's, what were you thinking on that day or whatever? Oh, God, it's yeah. like, oh, uh, that was six years ago. Right. I, that's hard to defend versus, well, they said yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. When you've been, when you've sat across from opposing counsel and they're asking you difficult questions, this one hits you pretty hard and mm -hmm. then you never, ever forget it. Oh yeah. Being deposed is no fun. No. So if you haven't been here, um, great. Good for you. You might, and you probably will at some point, I would assume. I don't know. But you'll be glad that you did this. Mm -hmm. You'll be glad that you used a system, a process. Uh, I did the same thing for everyone. Exactly. That's why I'm such a stickler it. on if it says it in policy, follow the policy. And then when you deviate from the policy, write a waiver. Right. So you've got why documentation. Did you do, why did you change this? Oh, I've got this document right here that says right. exactly why. I can't remember what I did last Thursday, right? let alone what I did last year. And so if you ask me, well, why did you make this decision with this third party or this vendor? I won't remember. Right. And if you do remember, you don't have enough work to do probably. You bet, yeah. You better have it documented somewhere of why you deviated from. Right. 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 That's and, why I like quantification. Well, and, and I think everybody, you know, people kind of complain about it, and but documentation about procedure and mm -hmm. like we need to have a repeatable process, the same thing every time. Right. It's not super exciting, but – Absolutely will save you in the long run. Right. And so when you quantify something, and so a lot of times people, when you think, when people think quantification, they immediately go to dollars, hmm. thinking that that's the only way that you can quantify something. And that's patently no. false. Right. I can quantify anything that I can measure. Right. And so um, it's implementing some form of measurement, setting a, an appropriate threshold. Right. 
right? So if your vendors or third parties in their questionnaires or whatever assessment you're doing, if they exceed that threshold of minimum risk, right, Pain. that's good. Yep. If they are deficient, they're below that threshold. And you may go further. You may ask additional questions even if they do exceed the threshold. Well, but that's not the point. If they say they've got it's a everything fail. personal, like uh, perfect, I mean. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have some threshold top and bottom, right? Exactly. All right. So uh, number five is objectivity. Binary decisions are more efficient, easier to defend, and scorable. So again, you you want to take that subjectivity out like we just talked about. Why did you accept this answer? Uh, because at the time that there wasn't that vulnerability right. out there, like it, that's a really hard thing to defend. So yes, no, all mm -hmm. the time, right? Yes, no, true, false. Uh, those open-ended questions. Anytime you see that in, in third party or any, you know, information security risk management function, it's open for interpretation. Right. Right. And then it's depending on who's writing the answer, who's interpreting that response. Are they at the same level? Right. It's, yeah. And as a as a vendor who used to receive, you know, now oh. we have other people who receive these questionnaires. But when I used to receive these questionnaires, I liked open-ended questions. Oh, I can put whatever I want, but it's also a pain. Well, but I liked it because I could tell you the truth and massage it. Right. Oh, no, I'm – If you, you, you would ask me a true-false question, I'd have to say, well, that's actually false. But if you say, you know – like, tell me about your information security program. Right. Awesome. I'm going to tell you all the great things about my information yep. security program. I'm not going to tell you anything about the bad stuff. Yeah. We use it, administrative, physical, and technical controls to protect the yeah. – boom, done. And then you'll be all impressed and pass me and I don't have passwords on anything. Right. Eight characters. <laughs> no complexity. All right. Uh, must have six, number six, inventory management. And this is not just for third-party – information security risk, but yeah, garbage in, garbage out. If you're not getting everybody, then yeah, it's not a good program. Well, it's so frustrating to, uh, you know, cause you'll ask people questions, you know, fortune 500 company vendor risk manager. I asked him, you know, how many vendors do you have? And he says, oh, about 600. I'm like about <laughs> right. A better answer to that would have been, as of the last time we did a vendor inventory, or vent, you know, it was six hundred twenty-seven. Right. That stands up in court much better than about six hundred. And I will say, I could see myself going, well, just over six hundred, and you're like, huh? Then, but then, right. being able to to come back and say, well, okay, exactly is this much, but I didn't know how detailed you wanted. But sure. that wasn't his response. No. No. So. Yeah, understand what it is, and it's ongoing, right? Right. At least the, annually, you need to go through, revisit all the existing ones, make sure you haven't missed anything. Right. This is an ongoing process. Well, and, and depending on, like I, I sort of mentioned it, depending on the churn in your third party relationship, yeah, it could change. If it's pretty stable, then maybe an annual reconciliation is plenty mm -hmm. fine to keep that inventory up to date. If you have a lot of churn, then you'll need to integrate it into your onboarding process with your vendors, right? Well, your procurement process, something. They and that, won't pay any third party unless they've got an S2 score, for instance. Right. Yeah, they have we, – we can't sign a contract. And we do see that from some of our customers. They're like, well, well hey, we, we signed this, but we can't actually do anything until we realize you're not in our third-party risk management. You know what? Right. I don't mind those. Right. No. That's a good sign from a, an organization that they're – they do have this kind of institutionalized of mm -hmm. we've got a good process in place that catches these things. Right. So it doesn't happen a whole lot, but it does happen. It makes me happy. Mm -hmm. And then number seven, uh, this is again, it funny how many of these are, are just good security principles you, in general. Uh, simplified processes. Complexity is the enemy of information security. Yeah. Don't, don't make this harder than it needs to be. Mm -mm. No. If, once you systemize this and operationalize this, it just becomes part of doing business. Yeah. Four steps, man. That's yeah. it. Sometimes you recycle between step four and step three, but it's four steps still. That's it. I, yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully that was uh, helpful for everyone, both the people receiving questionnaires and the ones sending it out and trying to manage a third party 
or a vendor risk management uh, program. So just fresh on, on the top of my head. So that was a, a good, yeah, good conversation today. Well, we've done it for years and I understand that it's not second, it's not second nature for many people. Um, once it becomes second nature, it's just part of doing business. You don't even think twice yeah. about it. Yeah. And yeah, institutionalize it, right? Yep. Get, get buy-in from the organization and actually stick to your guns. If you're, if it says, Hey, we can't do business with someone or we can't actually pay them until they're in the program, the, in, in the program. Right. Actually follow through. One of the business isn't going to back you up, you know, cause you do run into that too, where the business is like, well, they're so important that we need to do business with them anyway, even if they're not going to fill out the questionnaire. That's fine. Well, then the business is accepting that risk. Somebody, yeah. I'm about ready to write another article where the title is not my risk because the business makes those decisions. And if you don't enable and consult the business to be able to make those decisions, then what, you know, what the last thing you want to do is accept the risk yourself. Right. Or just. Yeah. Get get it it on paper. Scrape it under the rug. It's your job as, like you said, the CISO to advise and guide and provide that knowledge mm-hmm. to the business for them to make that decision. Right. Right. We, I can't, you know, we do it all the time as the virtual CISO. I cannot make a risk decision on your behalf. I right. can tell you what I would do. I can give you the, the pros and cons. Ultimately that's your call. Right. I'll tell you if you don't, if you, if I don't agree with it, that's fine. As long as it's documented, I'll do whatever the organization has made uh, their decision to be. So. Right. so if the business isn't going to sign off, if the business isn't going to enforce this with you, just ask them to sign a waiver. Yeah. That usually puts, that usually makes them think twice. You know, when I go to the CIO or I go to the CEO and say, that's fine. I get what you're saying. I yeah. just need you to sign the waiver. Right. So that we, you know, dot all our eyes and cross Funny all our people teeth. don't want their, their name on the line either. Weird. Right. Well, if you're expecting me to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, all right. Good discussion. Let's knock out some news real quick here. Um, right. We'll go into a whole lot of detail on these. But uh, first one is from Threat Post. Uh, ransomware costs doubled in Q4. Uh, they were saying uh, fourth quarter of 2019, average ransomware payment rocketed skyrocketed to $84,116, up from 41198 in the third quarter. So more than doubled. And we're not seeing that slow down. So uh, don't worry about it. Just you got cyber insurance. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, the other one is now you're starting to see exfiltration. And if you don't, even if you don't, if you recover and don't pay, they're threatening <clears throat> to release your data. Oh, don't worry about it. You get cyber insurance. So yeah, <laughs> fun. Um, <laughs> God, yeah. Cyber, that, that's the answer to everything, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so the second article was from uh, Krebs on security. I thought this was kind of funny. The DDoS mitigation firm founder admits to DDoS. So Georgia man who found co-founded the service designed to protect <clears throat> companies from uh, DDoS attacks has pled guilty to paying for DDoS for higher service to launch attacks against others. I mean, that's one way to drive business. We've talked about, <clears throat> you know, it usually it's a very, very, very short conversation. But back in the day when, you know, you're struggling for business, it's like, well, one way you could get business would be just to hack somebody. Right. You know, if you hack them, then they'll be like, oh, yeah, we do. We need your help. Shoot. I should. So it's, it's that same kind of thing. I mean, your service must have. Must not have been that good if you can't figure out ways to sell it without cheating. Right. Yeah. So. So throw the book at this guy. 22 years old. Yeah. Tucker T- Preston. Ten Up to 10 years in prison and a fa- fine of up to $250,000 or twice the gross gain or loss from the offense. How much prison time do you think you'll actually get? You know, it's a good question. They, they, I, it feels like they really throw the book at the computer crimes, you know, because the only reason why you'd punish is, I mean, uh, you're not the only reason, but a primary reason is deterrent, right? Mm -hmm. You want to deter people from following this, the, the the steps of Tucker here. I'm going to guess he gets a, a very large fine and, and not the full 10 years. 
So he pled guilty in a New Jersey court. He's from Macon, Georgia. Yeah. That's a don't don't do that is the advice. So the company he co-founded is called Back Connect Security LLC. He developed the unusual habit of hijacking internet address space. Huh. It didn't own in a bid to protect clients from attacks. So I mean his whole business was just BS. Yeah. Not just not just hiring DDoS attackers to attack, but it sounds like he also had some other issues. Yeah, not not good. Um Do you ever read those cases? Do you ever read like the actual Yeah, when they come out, I'll try indictment? to I read them. Some of those are really interesting. Oh, he pled. Yeah, he pled guilty. So oh. sentences in, in May. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be less than the, the maximum. No, but he pled. He's yeah. I don't. I would say that's where he's going to get some jail time. Just like you said, as a deterrent. But I think my guess is the majority of this is going to be in a monetary fine. That's going to be mm-hmm. like crippling, especially for twenty two years old to have yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines that you can't dismiss. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. All right. Uh, third story today is from GB Hackers. Snake ransomware written in Golong language removes backup shadow copies and encrypts Windows files. So that's um, not ideal. <laughs> yeah, uh, less than. Targeting Windows users to encrypt the system files and remove volume shadow copies that the OS uses for backup. So uh, you can no longer count on your local backups to uh, keep you safe. Uh, yeah. Ransomware is a service. Yeah. And they're saying they're using uh, AES-256 and RSA-2048 for the uh, keys. So good good luck uh, cracking that. Yeah. So targeting – this is the snake ransomware is targeting specific platforms such as SCADA, Enterprise Management Tools, System Utilities, and also some of the – Specific target applications include VMware tools, Microsoft system operating, or Cinder. We used to call that mom. Microsoft no. just operations manager. Now it's system center operations manager. Yeah. Nimbus, Honeywell, HMI Web, and FlexNet. Huh. Yeah. What would suck to hit was, you have a SCADA system get hit, I suppose, if there's a controller. Yeah, well, those things are never out of date and always patched. Um so what was interesting and fully redundant. It, yeah yeah uh what i thought was interesting was it that it actually writes the note to two different locations dependent on if it was executed as administrator or a standard or a normal user so you know if you're doing an ir it's pretty quick to understand yeah. hey well you've got some issues why was all where were all your users local admins right well, that's a good. It's a GB hackers did a good write up on this. So mm-hmm. if, if you do get a chance to yeah. go and read it, the title "Snake Ransomware that that written in Golang language removes backup shadow copies and encrypt window files." Yeah, it kills like SQL Server, Spooler, EXE. You know, a lot the Win VNC. So it kills a lot of processes that. So it can you know might have things locked. Um, next one, and just thought that uh, not surprising by any means, but from information, uh, InfoSec magazine, over half of organizations successfully fished in 2019. Um, uh, 55% of surveyed organizations dealt with at least one successful phishing attack in 2019. I think the most, uh, surprising is it was only 55% that were yeah, successful. See, I, I disagree with that. Well, but it was surveyed organization. So it does, and that's the only issue. It doesn't really say, you know, a lot of it. And it was, this is a report by Proofpoint, but. Um, Proofpoint, do they sell? What do they sell? Yeah. Oh, end, end point. Yeah. Okay. Data using from nearly 50 million simulated phishing attacks sent by Proofpoint to end users over a one year period. So it is from, it is there using. Their automated system. Look at, so. pr- look at Proofpoint's uh, homepage. State of the fish. It's like, yeah. Buy my shit. Excuse my language. 
I just, um, I just swore. Anyway, I, I would say, you know, it is obviously it is dependent on, on them and their system and maybe. Did you hear me swear? Yes, I did. I was going to ignore it though. Okay. Cause I never swear. Mm-mm, no. Um, All right. So 55% yeah, using automated fishing tools. Way, way low. Yeah. But you know, not, not terribly surprising that again, people are the, the weakest link yeah. as it were. So we can tell that through a vulnerability scan probably. Yes, absolutely. Right. Um, and then the last one on naked security by Sophos, uh, and, and you know, there's a lot to t- kind of digest, but NIST actually released new privacy rules and what you need to know. Um, I thought this was a really good write up of it. There's a bunch of articles out there, but I thought they did a really good job of kind of just breaking it down and understanding it. So, you know, identify P involves spotting and understanding privacy risk, govern, uh, define the rules to deal with them. Control is the function. Um, manage data in line with your governance structure and then communicate those. And then the final is protect. And that's kind of where it ties back into the NIST CSF. Oh, okay. So, um, but there's, you know, the, the privacy uh, rules and the NIST CSF do really tie together. Uh, So this is something that is, you know, out there and and they've said it's not the same privacy and security are different, but they do overlap. So I thought it was a good write up and something that is is definitely coming more and more. Right. So and I think the re- yeah, more to talk about on that later. That that'd be a good future podcast too to talk about how they are the same or different or where they well, overlap and yeah. know, all that stuff. Yeah, good it, good discussion. That would be I think fun. a lot of people don't know. Yeah, a lot of people treat them as separate. Yeah, we get questions about privacy specific and it's like well you know, that's that's more of a legal question around that versus the security piece of how you actually enforce controls to ensure privacy right, right? so kind of they dub like it says in there they dovetail together really well all right well that's it episode 64 is a wrap thank you to our listeners keep the questions and feedback coming send things to us by email at unsecurity at protonmail.com you're the social type socialize with us on twitter i'm at brad and i evan is at evan francine and lastly be sure to follow security studio and fr secure so at security studio and at fr secure uh, for more goodies that's it talk to everyone next week thanks thank you for listening to this episode of the unsecurity podcast We value our listeners and would love to hear from you. Give us your feedback by emailing us at unsecurity at protonmail.com. That's U-N-S-E-C-U-R-I-T-Y at P-R-O-T-O-N-M-A-I-L dot com. Be sure to tune in next week to hear the latest insights from Brad and Evan.